inspired this call for proposals was that they were trying to get to help the industry and try to solve some of the problems. It's a, it's a, a difficult shale. So sedimentology class. What's a shale? Some meteorologists among us. Can you explain what a shale is to everybody? All the sedimentologists are eating them. Is a shale coarse grained or fine grained? Fine. Fine. How fine? Very fine. Very fine. So fine that you can't even see the particles from the microscope. So that makes it difficult to work with. Turns out this shale is, is really, really compacted. It's, it's overpressured, which means it's dangerous to drill into. That makes the drilling more complicated. Um, it's full of all kinds of funky clays that cause problems. Um, it's largely calcareous. Is, is shale supposed to be siliciclastic or calcidic? Yes, it can be either one. This one is a little bit more calcite, which actually complicates the drilling process. It's just, it's a problematic, complicated unit. And, and so our job is going to be to, to look at that unit and, and learn what we can. I also learned that there are two other major unconventional, potential unconventional resources in, in the state of Mississippi. One of them is um, in the Mississippi Interior Salt Basin. It's a unit called the Smackover Brown Dense is this crazy name, but the smackover has been a really important reservoir in Mississippi all over the, the Gulf Coast for many years. Um, and apparently the smackover brown dense is what they think was at least one of the source rocks. So it's a very rich, very dense, unproducible with normal methods, but with unconventional resources. Um, people in, in Arkansas and, and Louisiana have made lots of money off the smackover brown dense, and there are people who would like to to work on it in Mississippi. And again, it's a complicated rock with lots of, of questions about it that have made it not really economic for Mississippi, and that's part of our proposal is to look at it in, in more detail. And it turns out there's a third area that has oil and gas in Mississippi <coughs> in that with unconventional resources, and that's the Black Warrior Basin. And in the Black Warrior Basin, TELUS, which is the, the, the biggest operating company headquartered here in Mississippi, um, is very interested in something called tight sands, which is yet another unconventional resource. It's just a rock that doesn't have a lot of porosity. Here's a picture, and there's a few holes, but, but not enough to, to produce from. Right? So it's a rock that you're going to have to go in and break to get any oil or gas out of it. Um, and the, the Black Warrior Basin, we're finding, is in a very complicated area. Um, it extends over into Alabama. But we have a good chunk of it. Actually, we, we are in the Black Warrior Basin here in, in Octagon County, or on the edge of it. And um, it's, it's, it's going to be complicated. There's a lot of work to do, but it's going to be So the proposal that we wrote was designed to try to deal with every problem that we could think of that might be an issue with any of this unconventional drilling to try to to try to protect the environment in advance of, of any economic boom. So, so we were looking at things like what's the baseline um, groundwater quality, and there's a whole list which I'm about to show you. But um, how can we protect the groundwater systems? How can we protect surface water quality? Um, one of the problems with fracking is, is when they re-pump fluids in the ground, or when they pump fluids in the ground, you can induce earthquakes. It's called induced seismicity. And it's not that big of a deal unless your chimney falls over and then it can be a big deal. And it's, but it's not something you want. You don't want to have a lot of earthquakes, right? Um, so, so we hope to, to get up models going to try to prevent that from happening. And then the other thing that, that we want to do on our technical team, because this is an economic and a technical proposal combined, is to try to figure out what we can do, to, what can we model, what can we study that will help the oil companies to increase their profit margin, to bring them back, to do more drilling, to increase the economic benefits for the state of Mississippi, the citizens of the state of Mississippi. And there's a, a lot of positive economic benefits to this kind of production. So, um, Dr. Paul has been called upon to do hydrologic assessment. I just found a random hydrologic assessment picture on the internet. Um, but it's exactly this kind of work that lots of field work um, involving wading out in the mud sometimes and um, testing water quality and you're, you can 
correct me if I'm wrong, your, your project includes both historic data, surface data, groundwater data, and major missing. Just the interaction. Okay, interaction between them. So very thorough baseline hydrologic assessment to see what what is it like down there. And they, we already know that there isn't enough surface water or enough groundwater right now to do everything that the industry wants to do. So we are working with engineers to try to figure out ways to collect more water or to use things like carbon dioxide for a, for, as a fracking fluid to, to try to enhance production and, and limit economic and environmental impacts. So trying to make it as, as good as possible. The data that Dr. Paul collects will be used to create models, and some of them will be simple models like this diagram, as simple as this diagram, some of them will be much more complicated, but to try to see how fracking in this area will affect the groundwater. And, and right now I can tell you that, that I don't think we're going to be anywhere near, I don't think we're going to be fracking anywhere near this close to the aquifer. I think it is a, an area that should be good, but that's the hypothesis to test. That's what we're going to go out and try to collect the data and see is uh, if we crack in this area, will it cause problems with people's groundwater? Can we can we model that? Can we before it causes problems? Can we change what we do to make it not a problem, make it better? Um, we're we're set up in this proposal to work with the the, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and I don't know if you're aware, but the university has. A, a, a lot of interest in trying to get us as faculty and graduate students to work with the National Lab. Because it's a great resource and it's one that we all pay for with our taxes. And they're, they're brilliant, wonderful people to work with. And so we've been fortunate to be linked to the, the Lawrence Berkeley Group. And they're the people who, who wrote the software for reservoir, reservoir modeling. And they have this phenomenal software for, for just overall reservoir models, but this is just another random one that I picked off the internet, um, but they can model things like induced toxicity, um, and then there are these wonderful reservoir reactivity models that you know, lead us to even more and better work. But they're, they're great people to work with, and, and normally when you're doing modeling, you, you know, you get the software and you do your model. When you work with them with the modeling, they say, well, what is it you want to do? We'll just rewrite the code. It's fantastic. You know, they're, they're great people to work with. So. Um, this is some of the react reservoir reactivity modeling, and this is not my picture, it's a cool picture from one of the, the scientists there at, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, Marco Bolotini, and it's a really cool image. It's a, an image of a, a fracture, and so when they, they, they go in and they create high pressure and fracture the rock, and then they push sand in. So this is a fracture in shale and sand grains. These are sand grains that have been pushed in into the fracture to hold the fracture open. And then this fracture, they sent CO2 through it to see how would CO2 work. And the CO2 has actually caused dissolution of part of the fracture surface. You can see where the, the sand grains were. It's colored of those red. But the, the, the surface, you see that little undulow surface? It's caused dissolution. You want dissolution because you want to open things up, right? Is that not cool? I think it's so cool that this is, has spawned other, spawned other research and that I think is going to lead us to, to proposals X, Y, and Z. Project number two is to look at reservoir reactivity. And I basically drafted for Dr. DeVito and, and anybody else that will work with me. There's a woman at Auburn and um, four of the Lawrence Berkeley people because I think this is such an a, a incredible science that they can model at this scale and then they fuse those models back in with the reservoir models and Close. They got big computers that have worked better than my brain. Okay, so that's project number two, an offshoot of project number one. And then the, the next proposal, the thing that I, I may be working on here in the next week or two, trying to get in touch with a, a program officer before we go forward. But so I've been working for a long time looking at, at sequestering CO2. That's, that's capturing carbon and tucking it in the ground where it can't cause problems. And the problem with that is that it's, it's really hard to do. And it's hard to do safely and it's, it's expensive to do. And so I had the crazy idea, I thought it was a crazy idea, that maybe we could take that captured carbon and make something out of it that we could sell. 
And it turns out I'm not the only person with that crazy idea, that there are a lot of people with that idea. Not a lot, but there are people. This is a, a, a someone sent me, this is from, was in Europe. Um, but there are people working on exactly that idea. It's taking captured carbon, CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into usable products. And there are all kinds of things you can do with that captured CO2. You can use it for oil and gas recovery, but that kind of creates more carbon. It's less valuable. Um, you can use it as feedstock for making products. Um, you can make like plastic out of CO2. But the problem with that is you've got to put a lot of energy into it. Okay? And that's less good. Um, there, there are ways to, to store it, and what I'm thinking that is a good way to do it is to create a stable, solid material that you could sell. Okay. Something you could sell. Um, that's why I'm sort of obsessed with that. There are other people looking at, at enhanced photosynthesis, so you store it in plants indirectly. Um, there's a lot of people on campus, there are people on campus working on carbon intake in soil. And, and it turns out the soil takes up a lot of CO2, but how do you keep it and how do you document that it stays? That's a little bit harder to do. Um, let's see, you can produce water, use that for useful things. And then um, there are people, there have been in the past, I think there are still a few of them working on hands, <coughs> using microbes to, to produce biofuels. There was a whole group that they were use, using sewage to produce um, biodiesel. Um, which is, that's great, you know, sewage and, you know, produce biodiesel. But um, I, I think that they ran out of products. I'm still sort of obsessed with this one, and I'm biased because my, my training is actually in fossil algae. Um, crazy. I, I, my, my grad school nickname was Slime Queen, because I really like algae. Um, but, I, and that's a crazy thing, but it's not. Because it, this building is built on a unit of the Selma Chalk. <coughs> and the Selma Chalk is the same, basically the same age as the White Cliffs of Dover. White Cliffs of Dover are more pretty and cooler, literally cooler than here. But they're the same unit. And they were deposited about the same time. And, and they, everything you see here is the skeleton of a microbe. Okay? And, and when you go out to the parking lot or something like that, everything you see in that cliff is the skeleton of a microbe, okay? Um, little phytoplankton that lived in the ocean, and they lived in the ocean at a time when the earth was really hot, CO2 was really high, and CO2 was pretty high, okay? And, and they thrived in that high temperature environment, and, and over time, they contributed to pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and storing it in the rocks that this building is built on, okay? And that's why I think that if we could figure out a way to do that, we could create and, and I don't know if you've ever dealt with any of the rocks around here, like in your backyard, digging a hole. They're big, heavy rocks. If we could, you know, make them in the right shape, maybe we could sell them to people and make money. And, I don't know, build walls around major cities that are threatened by flooding. Maybe. Who knows? Um, okay, so anyway, that's project, that's, that's, what was I on, three, I think. So now we go to project number four. Um, Project number four, so, and these are all projects that I'm imagining that are going to eat my summer vacations for years to come. Um, we had a student a few years ago, and she, she graduated in 2013, who did, she was really interested in, in, she wanted to save the world, and she wanted to save the world with geothermal energy. And she's now finishing her PhD in geothermal energy up in Idaho, where she may be done, correct, but um, she, she's close to finishing if she's not already done. But she pointed out at the time that she started her work that the, the geothermal map of the US shows, this, this basically shows places where we can use geothermal energy. And, and we know it's good around Nevada and you've heard of, maybe you've heard of geothermal out there. We have some fairly high values here, but it turns <coughs> out that, at least when she started her work, the, the map of Mississippi was done with two data points. And she thought that two data points wasn't really enough. Okay. I think this one has been improved a little bit, but I'm sure that it hasn't been improved as much as we would like to have it improved. And, and she, she, basically as an undergrad, she was an undergrad, and basically I think she was a junior when she did this work. She, um, for her honors thesis, for, for her undergrad degree, studied up on, on geothermal systems, 
and um, she realized that a binary system is one that that can be, it's a color binary system because it has a system that goes down in the ground and then it, that drives a, a system that drives a heat exchanger. So there's two circulation systems. But this one can, can work in areas where it doesn't have to be that hot. So temperature, she picked a temperature of about 135 degrees. She figured if you were in the subsurface at 135 degrees at a reasonable depth, that you could economically run a binary system. Um, there are other kinds of systems. There are enhanced geothermal systems, which are apparently very popular. And I think the temperature needs are a little different. They operate a little bit differently. But there, there are multiple systems. We could, I mean, that's, that's for engineers. I don't know. But um, yeah, you're an engineer, right? Yeah. An engineer should know. Oh. <laughs> anyway, the, the, if you want to know, ask an engineer, because they get really complicated. But what I do know is that they're expensive. Not that expensive. They're, they're, they're doable. So she set out to, to start collecting data. And she figured out how to go into the Mississippi Oil and Gas Board's website and pull out bottom hole temperature data. It's very tedious, boring work but she was able to figure out how to do it. Or you can um, get it off of well logs. We just got a donation of hundreds of well logs that are now downstairs in alphabetical order. Thank you for questions about help with that. Um, but you can pull, you have to search, and it's not kind of fuzzy, but you can get the bottom hole temperature off of that, too. And then Carrie has set it up for us where um, she's, she's done the math or figured out how to do the math. And we just get that information. and. She's got Excel spreadsheets set up for us. And what she did was create a map for Octavia County. And she mapped to, with the contours to 135, what's the depth. And she basically found that she thought that you could economically use a geothermal system in this county. And I think it's worth expanding that study to other parts of the state. Um, and, and I have a little bit of research on that we could, we could shift to that. And, and so I'm looking for undergraduates who are willing to tediously spend hours and hours looking at well log cutters and um, oil and gas board websites and try to, to put that in. And that we'll also need GIS help because it takes some GIS expertise to, to put that on a map. But it's a great study. Um, another study, so this is project number five that, that um, is, is down the road and, and we have engineers on campus who are really interested in doing, is to look at, at river turbines. And this has been looked at for the Mississippi River. Um, this was a, a, a pilot study that was done on the Rhine River in Germany. And these river turbines, you, you set them down in the water of a river, the river flows 24-7. And, and this study was very successful. And river turbines are very cleverly designed, again, great engineering, I talk to the engineers for the details. But they're designed to not hurt the fish, and they're designed to not leak any oil or toxic substances. They just sit down there in the water and, and generate electricity. They're not huge, so you're not generating a lot. But if you have a lot of them along the river, you could generate a significant amount of electricity. Um, and, what, and I'm not sure why the Mississippi River study, or there was a project that we're going to try to put river turbines there. And it fell through, and probably fell through when the price of gas went down, oil and gas went down. Um, but there could have been others, because the Mississippi River is, is it's a very busy system. It's a very dynamic system. It's going to be a hard one to work with. I have wondered for a long time why nobody looked at the Tom Bigby Waterway. I talked to engineers about this, and they got all excited. They were like, yes, this would be great. Um, because it's a, it's, it's a, it is a busy waterway. But it's not as busy as the Mississippi. It's smaller than the Mississippi. It's not quite as dynamic as the Mississippi. But it consistently has water flowing down it. And I, I know when I moved here from Texas, the first summer I was here, I was, it just absolutely blew my mind. Because in Texas, in the summer, the creeks dry up. In Mississippi, in the summer, there's water in the creeks. Did y'all know that's a really cool thing? Y'all didn't know. It is. Okay? It's a big deal. Um, but there's always water in the Tom Bigby. It's, 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 it's a shipping channel, basically. It's always flowing. And it's got to be deep enough for the boats. And I think that it would be deep enough and, and flowing enough to be economic for river turbines. That's the hypothesis to test. In order to do that, 
We're going to need meteorologists to, to tell us about climate data, discharge data, things like that. We're going to need engineers who can help us with flow rates and turbine design, things like that. And then we also need geologists because one of the things that I was talking to an engineer and he was like, and then the sediment kind of has these strange patterns and it moves around. This is kind of a problem. And I'm like, yes, that's, that's what geologists are good for. We can figure that out for you. We can help with that. We can predict the, the, where, where the sediment's going to go and where it's going to be problematic, where it's going to be less problematic, where you're going to get erosion. So there's, there's potential here for other proposal writing that's going to ruin my summers for the next site. I figure there's five years of ruined summers for me here. Um, so, to conclude with this, one of the things that, that, that has driven me is, is the concept of global change. So I was trained as a petroleum geologist, and then when I, the first year I taught, I, I started to learn more and more about climate change. And I've never really worked as, I've worked with oil companies, but I've never really worked as a petroleum geologist. And, and this is, are, are there any meteorologists here today? Can, can anybody tell me when weather becomes climate? You just had climate classes. What's the difference? What's this a picture of? Weather or climate? What looks like multiple tracks, so that might be a climatology. So and I think maybe the answer would be yes. There's some weather days, but then together, could you call it climate? So and this is and this is just a. It's it's been an exceptional <coughs> year, but it's a it's kind of a wake up call kind of year. So any one of those storms is just a weather event, but we've had a lot of them, and there's more forming. And it's just like, well, how many more can the Caribbean take? Right. Um, and and I think that I think that as you when you go beyond one big storm and go to multiple storms, you can start to say, oh, maybe we are seeing the result of climate change. And so why, why does that matter? Well, for me it matters for, for I, I was, I, like, I didn't do this last week, I was supposed to do this last week and I couldn't do it because I was supposed to talk to some um, people coming from um, Washington, Dr. Cochran, Senator Cochran's office were coming here and I, I thought it was going to conflict with this, so I canceled this. And, and they're really interested in the research, the fracking, they're interested in all of this. And, and I told them, you know, if it were just up to me, I would look at pretty fossils because I like pretty fossils. I really don't like looking at shale. It's really complicated. It's kind of ugly. <laughs> but it matters, and it matters to my kids. And, and I, one of my students came in one day and said, and she told me that her, her dissertation had to be meaningful. And that really was a life changer for me. It's like, okay, I, gotta do, I can't look at pretty fossils. I got to look at something that matters to people. And this work all has economic impacts, and all hopefully has positive impacts, hopefully more positive than negative. All right, that's enough of me talking. Either get to eat more pizza or ask me questions. <laughs>
part of the reason it's too expensive to use is because they um, have the technology, they've installed the technology <coughs> to capture CO2 as they burn the coal. Coal produces more CO2 than, than gas, it, it produces lots of CO2, dirty CO2. And they, that one of the things when they were getting the permits to build it, they said, okay, we'll capture 65% of this, the carbon dioxide. Um, and they were hoping they could sell it to oil companies, but when the price of oil went down, so they want to capture it in at the source of the carbon dioxide. They want to sequester it in place. In place, basically, pump it back down into the ground that it came out so of. So those two don't line up. You need to then you have put it in a truck and. Yeah. Then then the idea is to sell it or to turn it into something you can use. Like, and 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 the problem is that you've got to turn it into a lot of something that you can use. That's why I'm thinking more like concrete blocks because. We use lots and lots of concrete, and I just can't think of any other product that we use enough of, even plastic, there's just not enough of a market for it. Although it seems like we use tons of plastic too. The, the chemists, there are a lot of chemists on campus who think this is a good thing to do, and the chemists tell me that there's just not enough plastic usage to capture it. They thought maybe cement. Do we know what its strength level is, what its tensing strength would be? If it were, if, it, if it's by itself, or is it better to combine it with something? You, 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 that's one of the things, things that we need to be researched. Because, like, chalk is not a particularly, it doesn't have a high tensile strength. It, it breaks very easily. Um, and, and so, yeah. well, we're constantly looking for things for cement mixes and, and making them lighter or more durable. So it's highly possible that I'd be interested in that kind of dynamic in this, in this area. That, that I think that, that what I learned from chemists was that um, the big problem is getting the energy input to change the bonds. As they explained it to me, I thought this was brilliant. Is, is CO2 is, is the lowest energy of the carbon bonds, right? And so you've got to put energy in to get it to a product that you need. Um, and the, the simplest things to make would be like methane fuel, um, because that takes the least amount of energy, but it's not volumetrically not enough to compensate for all the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy question. Do you know if any uh, biochemists or microbiologists on campus here are working on like large-scale CO2 fixation or they, hydrocarbon they, degradation? Yeah, they definitely. I met two last week. Um, one, There's one group that's looking at soil and, and looking at how much CO2 goes into soil. And then there are um, multiple <coughs> people in the chemistry department looking at modeling CO2 uses and things like that, because it's, it's easier to start with modeling before you do the experiments. Um, so. so I think biogeochemistry might have something. There might be a role to play there. Yeah, and I mean, Dr. Paul's dissertation dealt with that. I mean, it's, lots of people are, are, are looking at that in different ways. How, can you, how can you pull enough CO2 out of the atmosphere and trap it in a safe way? And it's, it's not easy. Right. Well, it's like, <coughs> this is the thing you've got here, how to do it. Uh, sure, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it exists. It, it, we can go back to the, the, the Lycos of Dover that, that is one of my favorite pictures um, because it's pretty. But um, when you look at that, Um, 
but we could probably figure out how to do it if we worked at it hard enough. Um, but then, you know, how do you do it on a scale yeah, that's, that's large enough to... to and I've, I've, some people have looked at just like throwing fertilizer in the ocean to get this kind of algae to grow. But then you worry about what if we throw off the whole ocean ecosystem? Maybe not. So it's dead zone from Gulf of Mexico because we're pumping fertilizer into the ocean. Yeah. So we're thinking yeah. about doing so that on a global scale. <laughs> it's may, maybe There's not such a good idea. Yeah. I, I, I looked at that and thought, eh, you know, I'm not going to put my name on that. But, just a broad picture question. Uh, because there was a lot of algae and photosynthetic bacteria because of the right temperature conditions because of excess CO2, do you think that with the excess CO2 and the temperature, nature will itself increase the amount of algae that's growing in the ocean? I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure why in the Cretaceous the, the ocean went ballistic, but certainly there are some organisms that do better with high CO2, like um, kudzu and poison ivy apparently like the global increase in CO2, and they're, they're very happy and they grow more prolifically than they used to, which is problematic. So you know, maybe these guys like, like CO2. I, I, it's been so long since I really worked in algae that I couldn't tell you. Possible. I think that the, one of the issues is the amount of CO2 available is the limiting factor of our, the algal growth. So it's not that the, the ocean's a huge sink for CO2 and there's excess CO2 in the ocean. So it's not necessarily a problem that if we just add more CO2, more algae would grow, and maybe there's other limiting factors keeping the populations from growing. The right fertilizer and the right amount. And you have, the sun would have to shine. <laughs> 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 Yeah, there's multiple variables, and it's, it's a very tricky ecosystem to... We've gotten in trouble manipulating ecosystems in the past. Okay, I see that we're approaching time, and I know people have to go to class, and there's pizza, looks like there's some pizza left. So, um, if you've got other questions, thank you for coming, and if you've got other questions, but I want to let people get to class and eat pizza. Thank you. And thank you, my class.